Today's show, we should let you know, is going to be a profoundly intimate type of show, a deeply personal show, not only because we're talking about sex, but because we're talking about sexual dysfunction, whether there's too much sex, too little sex, or no sex at all in a relationship. But most importantly, this show is a show about hope, hoping to save relationships, not letting sexual problems get in the way. For millions of women whose partners suffer from some form of sexual dysfunction, we may have some answers for you. We're going to be joined by a therapist who says that if a woman does not know how to react to what her man is going through, she can actually make the problem worse. Male sexual dysfunction and what you as a partner can do about that, it's something worth talking about today on Rolanda. amazed to know that 40 percent of adult American men have sexual problems at some point in their lives and countless men are what you would consider sex addicts. We'll explain what that means. Suzanne says that the man that she is engaged to is obsessed with sex and that she oftentimes gets jealous of the women in pornographic movies that Bill watches. Please welcome Suzanne and Bill. Um, I, I first of all want to say that I know this is a tough topic for a couple to come on national television and talk about, but what I applaud in what you're doing is having the courage to come up to save your relationship, first of all. Um, just tell me, if you could, give us an idea of just what an obsession means. Is, this, this is, is Bill someone you would consider a sex addict? Basically, yes. I mean, he, he enjoys having sex often. Mm -hmm. What does often mean, just so um, we can get an idea? At least four times a week, at least, you know, every day if he could. Mm -hmm. Now there's a reaction out there where you don't think, <laughs> there's some, now listen, there's some people saying, honey, you are lucky. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, let's be realistic, so you're going to have to break it down where we can get it. Actually, yeah. actually, we both felt like we were pretty lucky when we met because uh, we were both pretty obsessive. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten to a point uh, recently where... My obsession's still right up there, and hers has kind of slowed down a little bit, you mm. know, which is where the problem comes from. Where did things change? How did it change? I think just different circumstances, asking to do something different, or you're not feeling comfortable doing it, mm -hmm. and it's just, it just turns it off. I mean, is there some kinky sex going on well, you feel uncomfortable? sometimes, yes, but I think everybody has kinky sex. Mm -hmm. but variety is a variety. Word. Variety. So I'm trying to understand what the problem is. Is it, is it just too much? Is four times a week far too much for you? It's or? just the pressure of doing it when he wants to do it and constantly doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, and if I don't feel like doing it, then I feel guilty for not. Mm -hmm. How bad has it gotten? It's... it's I don't think it's it's gotten to where it's going to be a an overwhelming problem for us. At least I don't think so. Um, I did see where it had a, a profound effect on my my first two marriages. I've been married twice. Um, it was it was hard to try and build a good solid relationship when you're constantly feel um, rejected or um, upset with the other person. Maybe you're a little bit shorter with them than you normally would because. You know, they've been fluffing your advances off for a few days, and mm -hmm. it just, um, I can see where it had a big effect on my first two marriages. So the failure of your first two marriages was very much the same problem that you're about to go into a third marriage with. It was more profound with them, because like I said, Suzanne and I are a lot more alike than my other mates were. See, mm -hmm. I enjoy it also, but just not as often mm -hmm. as he enjoys it. Mm -hmm. So I, you never, I never really thought of myself as obsessive either. I, I think if you probably polled your male audience here, you know, any of these guys in here, if they could have sex a couple times a day, I mean, they'd, well, they'd be Well, guys, like, let's, let's go, ask you, know? you. We have a lot of guys here. How Am I wrong? Is, let's ask, who thinks that four times a week is obsessive? Oh, boy. How many men in here would like sex four times a week? 
More. More. Okay, let me see a show of hands. How many women would like four times a week? Well, I'm with them on okay, that. I'm sorry. Let me explain. <laughs> Rolanda, let me explain. Okay, this is... This is... Quiet down, quiet down, quiet down. Okay, now when we first met, mm -hmm. when we first met, it was like, he'd look at me and he says, honey, it's sex 30, you know? And sex be, 30. It's sex 30. Mm -hmm. And we would go and it was like twice a day. Now this is over a three year period that it subsided to four times a week. Mm -hmm. But when we first met, it was nonstop. Now I understand that Bill, ha you have started uh, turning to, to porn movies and that type of thing to kind of fill in the gaps. Is that uh, what it is? I don't he know enjoys if I would, them. I would put it that way. I mean, it's, he it's, enjoys it's, them. It's been something that's always kind of been a part of it. It's, it's not something all of a sudden, oh, I have a problem. I can't have Suzanne. Let me go watch a movie. No, uh -huh. no. Uh, it's something that we've even at times, you know, enjoyed together. And mm -hmm. I've, I've seen that in relationships too, where it seems like early on in the relationship, women um, I don't know if it's just to pacify the man or what, but they're willing to, to partake in a little bit of that with you. And it, it's always worked out great. You know, you always had a good time. And then all of a sudden, they stop that. They don't want to watch the movies anymore. But there's anymore. something about, wanna... about Bill watching this porn movie that's, that's starting to bother makes, you. It makes me feel that he's more interested in the women in the movie no. than he is with myself. And I think most women feel that way. They're jealous. Anything... Even sex, I mean, as great as sex is, anything in your life that you do over and over and over and over and over and do it the same way every time is going to get boring. It could be your most favorite thing in the whole world, which sex is to me. But if, if I And clearly to, you are not alone, Bill. If I, had to, if I had to do it the same way every time, no variety it would get boring. But how do you deal with that? Because you're not alone either. Uh, I mean, in, in, okay. in terms of a woman's side of view, point of view, I mean, how do you deal with my man wants sex, I really don't want to give it to him. If I don't give it to him, then I, you know, how do you cope with that? I tell him to go watch a movie. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I would rather him do that, like he says. He would, it's, it's either that or go out on me, which he won't do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I feel like if I can't satisfy him, then he can satisfy himself. Does any of this go back to, to like, when you first started having sex, going way back? I mean, is there anything in your history that is making this situation the way it is today? Or I think I started an addict. Um, I was broken into sex by an older woman. Uh, she was married. Her husband was off in the service, good friend of the family. How old were you? Uh, I was 14. Mm -hmm. And how old was this woman? Uh, she was 19. Mm -hmm. And she was insatiable. She, she was, it was like all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how I got started. <laughs> and, <laughs> I and, liked uh, it. <laughs> and Suzanne, how, what do you think is it? I mean, because you, you guys are about to go into a marriage. Mm -hmm. This isn't how you go into a marriage, I don't Let's think. See, every other thing in our relationship is perfect. Everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do everything together from sports to watching t football, mm -hmm. you know, to going out. So here's your opportunity right now. If you wanted to say to Bill, what would you say to Bill about what you want in your sexual relationship? For him to be more attentive to myself than with himself, basically. Mm -hmm. And what he likes, you know, please me too. Which he does please me. Is it, you know, uh, what, what women oftentimes um, get frustrated with is a lack of foreplay. I mean, is that what I hear you saying? That you're not paying attention to me, you're just jumping on my bones and it, it's, well, I mean. <laughs> sometimes yes, but then sometimes there's foreplay. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not bad. I can't say it's bad sex. We enjoy each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Bill goes, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll talk more about this because it just okay. seems like the timing is off or something there. I just, um, hmm. If you think that having too much sex is a problem, so is having too little. When we come back, we're going to meet a couple whose marriage is right now in a major crisis because of a lack of interest in sex. We're going to sort through all of these problems in just a moment. Stay with us. Joining 
Yes, we're talking today about um, sexual dis dysfunction among men and what women in a relationship can do to help that because the main thing we're trying to do here is save relationships. Suzanne and Bill are engaged to be married and they're kind of, it seems like you're kind of off keter on that sexual thing. Bill says he wants to have sex about four times a week and Suzanne is saying, wait a minute, that is way too much. I'm jealous of these pornographic movies you're looking at. I'm tired of all this. No, Bill the says he wants it twice a day, but I've Oh, I'm you counted it out. Okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, one of the things that, that you were talking about, I know, in your relationship is the jealousy factor, mm -hmm. the jealousy that comes out of this. Um, why is there jealousy? Well, because his sex drive is so strong, and I know that. So automatically when he goes somewhere and, like, if he goes to the beach without me, and, you know, I always wonder, and I always think he's doing something wrong. Is that because you think that if I don't want to have sex exactly. as many times as he does, and he's going to go find somebody exactly. else? Yes. That yes. and past experience, too, yeah. that mm -hmm. she's had as prejudiced her. She had... Yeah. From other relationships. Right. Yeah. Now, right. we know that's the number one problem. Don't yeah. bring that baggage into a new <laughs> relationship, right? You know, if you think about it, there's, there's three things. I mean, you have three options. When you ask your mate to make love, if they say no, you either don't have sex, and that's, you know, you've already asked. I mean, you obviously wanted to. Or you go out and have sex with someone else, or you take care of it yourself. And I, I have always been in a monogamous, monogamous relationship, and you know she just—it's gotten so bad as far as her jealousy that I fear. I look around my car for things that I have left in it that might, that she might look at and think <laughs> somebody was in here or somebody he was with somebody. And I do it that. Gets that bad. I do it that. Really does. I, I get and in the car and the seats on. out of line. You know, I'm like, so who was in the car on. today with you? But Suzanne, you, know? you don't feel good when you do that. No, I don't. No, no, I, I don't. don't. Yeah. I mean, because you've it's been kind of teary-eyed during this whole conversation. I think it's, it's just through past experiences that I expect him to do it because mm -hmm. I've always had it done to before. Mm -hmm. When you say, okay, all right, I'll go to bed with you tonight. I don't really want to, <laughs> oh God, but like I that. will do that. that she doesn't, do you ever, does it get to that point? If or? she said it like that, I'd say, never mind. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> but do you ever make love when you really don't want to? I have, yes. And what does that do for you? It's or just do nothing. It does nothing. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, I'm, I feel guilty because I know he wants to and I'm not satisfying him, so I feel like I have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you guys going to work this thing through? Good question. Time we're gonna will tell. Have, we're going to have a couple of therapists on later, and I want you to share some of your concerns with her because y'all got to deal with this before you get married. You don't go into a marriage like this, right? Okay, let, let, let's meet another couple now. Um, sex therapists say that low sexual desire is the number one complaint that brings a couple into treatment. Our next couple knows the frustration and the pain all too well uh, that it brings to a marriage. This is a married couple we're going to talk to. Sally and Bob have been married for 11 years. Sally says their sex life is almost non-existent now and that they're more like brother and sister living together than husband and wife. They have decided to come and talk with us in silhouette as you can imagine this is a tough situation for them um, I'd like to welcome you to with us here today <laughs> Sally what is what is going on in your relationship obviously there is no sex and I'm and I'm just wondering I understand that your your marriage is at a crisis point right now well we don't have sex um, maybe once or twice a year and um, I'm at the opposite end of the spectrum from the girl previous mm -hmm. um, Suzanne. where she said that um, she worried about him going out and stuff my husband is past military and they could go off on tours for six eight months or a year at a time and it never entered my mind that he would even think about this because he has no sexual desire at all. Bob, why not? It's hard to say. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes, um, you know, when we go through frustrating times in life or the business is doing bad or you're getting a lot of, you know, grief from the boss, that those types of things can interfere with us sexually. Is there anything like that, any outside pressure outside the house, Bob, that might be lending to this? I don't think it's the outside pressures. I think a lot of it's got to do when I was growing up, when I was younger, 
I think a lot of it had to do with my brother sexually molesting me. Oh. And it was, it was one of them hard things. I've never told anybody. I've never discussed it. Out of 11 years, I told, after 11 years of marriage, I told my wife that two years ago. You have never talked about this before, huh? No, never have. What I hear you saying is that you're ready to deal with this. I need to deal with it because I've got to save my marriage. What is it about that abuse as a kid that you think might be affecting you as a man now? I really don't know. That's why I, I think that's why we need to seek a, a therapist where we can find out really what the problem really is. Mm -hmm. There's we times I want to have sex and, you know, like before, you know, she says no. And I can understand why she says no, because we don't have it that often. Mm -hmm. It's probably an awful lot of guilt or something going on there. We, we've got some therapists who are going to come on later in the show and, and help us through this. Sally, in the meantime, what do you do when you're living with your husband and you want an intimate relationship with him and it's just not coming forth? What do you do instead? Well, at one point in our marriage, um, I had an affair. And um, that was one of the things that two wrongs don't make a right mm -hmm. and um, I told him that I had an affair and when I went to him to tell him that I had the affair I told him I said don't scream at me don't um, he's never physically abused me at all that that never even entered my mind but um, I told him I said don't yell at me don't you know don't scream at me or anything because I feel like you have put me in this position where I have asked so many times and been turned down so many times um, I feel like I know what it's like for a man I guess or a young boy going out on a date <clears throat> excuse me um, for the first time and he's asking someone to go out and he keeps getting turned down mm -hmm. and everything and after you get turned down so many times um, it's, it's like having a glass of water in front of you and you're so thirsty that you want to drink and then when you get the water it doesn't taste good at mm. all and it, it really creates problems because when we do have sex um, I couldn't ask for anything to be any better he's very he's very loving he's very caring he's very passionate um, I love him with everything that there is but there's a part of me that is being left out. Mm -hmm. um, there's a part of me that I think, you know, you'd like to blame it on middle age and stuff because your fuse is getting a little shorter and, <laughs> and everything. Well, um, my, my fuse is so short now that I blow up at everything. And I think all, all it is is just everything that's held inside because... <clears throat> I don't have the closeness. Mm -hmm. I don't have the, the well, tenderness. I think, Sally, one of the things that, that is encouraging is that um, Bob has certainly said one of the things he thinks is the root of this. And when we bring our therapist in, we'll, we'll start with that and see what some things are that might be adding to the problems. But it's a, it's a shame that it took nine years of marriage and nine years of being turned down and nine years of me questioning myself. Mm -hmm. Is it me? Am I doing something wrong? Okay. Hold on just a second, Sally, because that is a, oftentimes what women do, is we think it's us. Um, maybe what we need to do is help the relationship, and we're going to learn how to do that today. You know, one of the leading causes of impotence in men is prostate cancer, which affects so many men as they get older. In fact, according to the American Cancer Society, it will affect one out of every ten American men in their lifetime. Coming up next, a couple is going to tell us firsthand how prostate cancer affected their sex life. It's something we all should pay attention to. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> Our very 
very frank discussion about sexual dysfunction among men. I, I tell you, um, I, I must say that I was really encouraged uh, listening to, to Sally and Bob, who, Bob, I think it was the first time that you had mentioned, you said that it was the first time that you revealed the abuse as a child. And I understand this is the first time that you have said that you're willing to work with a therapist on this. Yes. Okay. Well, that, that's a move in the right direction. That's a move in the right direction. Yeah, Bill. I, I personally can really sympathize with this woman, too, because, I, like I said, I went through this with two marriages. And, you know, in my mind, when two people are in love, and I mean are really in love, they, they should want each other all the time. I mean, it shouldn't be a question, oh, not now. No, they, that should be something that's built into loving someone. Mm -hmm. And it's real hard to understand when you ask your mate, your loving mate, your loving partner in your life, to make love to you, it's hard to understand why they don't and mm -hmm. why they don't want to or, you know, what's going on. I mean, it, it, it hurts. Well, I know exactly what she, she is feeling. Bill, I think it also goes mm -hmm. back to something that whether it's a problem with sex in a relationship or not, it goes back to that communication thing, talking it out, talking about why I'm not going to bed with you. Because a lot of times, exactly. I don't know about you ladies in the audience, but, you know, when we get rejected, we feel like, was it something we did? Was it, did my waist get too big? I mean, I mean, what, you know, and we take it all on ourselves and we, we have to go through the self-esteem thing. Guys probably go through the same thing as what you're saying here. Sometimes nature, I mean, disease, uh, things that we can't plan on um, affect our sexual relationships. Among men, um, particularly, we are dealing with uh, prostate cancer, which affects, as we said, one in 10 men. I'd like you to meet Fran. She says that before her husband, Alan, had his prostate removed two years ago, they had a terrific sex life. But after the surgery, his desire for sex diminished. They say that, that even though they have been happily married for 31 years, the lack of sex has actually put a strain on their relationship. Thank you so much for being here today. How has the prostate cancer affected you? Tell me specifically. The desire has diminished, or is it a, I mean, or is it a problem with erection, or what is the problem that Well, it's a combination of, of both, really. Mm -hmm. uh, maintaining a, an erection is difficult because your prostate is part of the stimulation, and if your nerve endings are gone, you really can't do too much about it. Mm -hmm. In my case, the surgery was uh, nerve sparing, so I was going to be able to function again. One of the things they don't tell you about a prostate operation is that, or the after effects of a prostate operation, uh, most of the urologists or surgeons that do this claim that you'll be functioning within three to nine months, and I haven't really met anyone who was completely functioning at that point. Hmm. So it was a lot of frustration. Why would they not? Why would this not be part? I mean, because it seems like if you're going to have prostate cancer surgery, that that should be a, a couple's uh, communicating with the couple, so they're very full aware. Nobody let you know this. No, they. I think they don't tell you because they're afraid that you won't go for the operation. Wow. And because they know that if they tell you the truth, that you're more likely to go for the other option because there's another op. There are other, are other options. There's the um, radiation therapy. There's hormone therapy, but the um, having the prostate removed is really the best for long-term survival. And um, so since the um, men who are having prostate cancer now are younger and younger, it used to be an old man's disease, it isn't anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so they don't tell you so that you'll, the choices will be limited, I mm -hmm. think. T please explain before we go any further why you guys are asked to be in disguise today. Well, we, just... well we're, we were concerned about it. We're local people. We, uh, we just felt we might be embarrassing mm -hmm. ourselves, our children. Mm -hmm. and we but just but I understand, as you over. told my producer, you thought it was important enough to come here yes. and let other couples Definitely. know right. that before you go in for surgery, please be aware that right. these are the types of repercussions. And, and we did a lot of research, and we still didn't know. 
Mm -hmm. you know, as much research as you do, you really don't know. And we were, I mean, we were fortunate that we had a very good surgeon. We did a lot of research. Mm -hmm. We had a very good consulting doctor. But, but nobody... it was never mentioned how long it would take. So what does the lack of a, you know, because you said that for 31 years of marriage, you had a terrific sex life, and then all of a sudden, boom. What, does, what is it that you miss other than the physical pleasure? The closeness. Because mm -hmm. that comes with the physical physical closeness is, you know, becomes uh, more emotional, too. Mm -hmm. Fran, what have you had to do as a wife to be supportive of the man that you love? I mean, we all know that, boy, for men, I mean, it's tough to talk about this kind of thing, and mm -hmm. they don't usually like to be, they're not as open as you, Alan. I mean, Fran, how have you had to deal with this to keep the man you love strong and with you? Besides walking out when he bothers me? <laughs> um, it's um, trying to give more emotional support than I'm used to because in the past it was um, uh, Alan's always been a very giving person so it's more I sh try to give and it's mm -hmm. difficult because it really changes our relationship well I, th I guess because men are so used to giving and women mm -hmm. receiving whatever right. that you know that right. it's hard to it's flip control. that it's, it's a control a thing role reversal where the man becomes more passive and the woman becomes mm -hmm. more the aggressor Hold on, we're going to continue this conversation. We're also going to, I think it's time to bring those two sex therapists that we invited to the show to come on and give our couples some sound advice and maybe even help you at home if you're going through this because our hope today is to help save a relationship and to understand how to deal with these things that seem so undealable. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> show, as we've been saying, is trying to save a relationship when the man is having a sexual problem. Before we left, we were speaking with uh, Fran and Alan, and, and Alan, I understand that after your prostate cancer surgery, that you actually tried to use the pump that we've heard so much right. about. Can you explain what the pump is and how that worked in your relationship? Okay, it was a really start invented by a man named Osborne, and that pump primarily is, uh, you place it over your penis, and it looks like a type of gun and it forms a vacuum and it actually pumps the blood back into your penis at the base of your penis you have a ring that you put on to maintain or keep the blood in your penis and mm -hmm. keeping your penis erect mm -hmm. does it feel different when you make love with the with the pump uh, it does feel a little different mm -hmm. uh, you normally when you're having sex blood is circulating through your penis to some degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though the veins do seal off the blood so you maintain an erection. Mm -hmm. But uh, your mate tells you that uh, it, it is feels less warm. Mm -hmm. Now, Fran, how did that work for you? Was that sexually stimulating for you or is that Not even... Not really, no. It's, it is very cool to cold. Mm -hmm. And so it's it feels quite different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's funny because I hear some snickering back there. See, y'all don't think I'm listening to you, do you? What are you snickering about? What is the laugh? You better be lucky you don't have to go through these situations. Who's laughing and what are you, is it just nervous laughter? Exactly. It, come here, tell, come here, tell me what you're thinking. Because no, but that's reality. I mean, you know, it's so funny because when we talk about sex, people do, I mean, it's kind of like a nervous thing. What are you thinking? Well, I'm just thinking it's a—it's kind of a nerve, it, like you said, it's nervous laughter and you kind of don't want to have to deal with it or mm -hmm. think about it. And when you do think about it, the, the release is to laugh yeah. because it makes you feel, you know, kind of awkward. Yeah, I mean, because, come on, wait, well, let me talk to you about this. <laughs> no, because, because it is difficult for men to talk about sex, particularly, well, you can talk about sex, but when it comes to sexual dysfunction, right. does this make you feel uncomfortable just listening to these stories? Um, it doesn't make me feel uncomfortable, but I, I, I mean, to be honest, when I came in here and I heard, first heard the topic, I thought, oh, ha, ha, ha. Now I, I, I kind of feel for these people mm -hmm. as I'm hearing about it, and it's educated me. That's right, because, honey, you never know when something exactly. like that may happen in your own relationship. Thank exactly. you for being honest about that. I, I, I'm glad we got to what you were snickering about back there. 
Let's bring in our two experts here now. Uh, they are here to help all of us understand and cope in case we're in this situation. I want you to meet Eva Margolis. She is the director of the Center for Sexual Recovery here in New York City. She's also the author of a new book. It's called Undressing the American Male, Men with Sexual Problems and What Women Can Do to Help Them. Also joining us is Douglas Weiss. He's a psychotherapist and the author of a book entitled Women Who Love Sex Addicts. We're happy to have both of you. Now, Suzanne and Bill have a problem, and Suzanne pretty much thinks that Bill is a sex addict. You wrote the book for Suzanne. Uh, what do you She's say? To love me, though. <laughs> she's, oh, she well, loves you. That's she, why she's here. I think here. she does love him very much. And, you know, I want to say uh, thank you for being so brave because this is very hard to talk about. And I deal with this in the, the Heart Heart Counseling Center in Fort Worth. And it's hard to get honest. But you guys have so much going for you that it could really work. What I'm hearing from, from Bill and also from Bob was there was sexual abuse in the background. I'm a survivor of homosexual sexual abuse, and that threw me into sexual compulsivity for many years. And so I know where, where that goes. And if it's a woman that sexually abused you, it's really hard to be honest about that. It's like, well, we're, that was lucky mm -hmm. in our culture. But it wasn't. It, it affects us, and it, it affects our sexuality and our perceptions of sexuality. And that threw me into the pornography and being sexual with myself. And what I was hearing is you'd like it two times a day, but there's also, there may be like, thoughts that go on in your head. A lot of guys have the fantasies that go on from being in a picture. Sometimes you um, find yourself looking more than you need to be doing, stuff like that. And your heart's to be faithful, and that, that's really good. That's not always the case. Sometimes it gets or it's worse and worse and, and includes other behaviors. Mm -hmm. But um, it sounds like you're discovering if you are sexually compulsive, and if you are, there's a lot of hope for someone who is, because uh, I've learned how to have a different kind of sex, because as, as someone who's in this situation, it's like we have sex, but we're like somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Doug, hold okay. on, hold that, hold that thought, because a lot of folks worry if if sexual fantasies are actually getting in the way of a relationship, and that that could be part of the jealousy issue that Suzanne's yeah. going, uh huh, yeah, that's exactly, uh huh. Yeah. It's tough. It's rough when you're jealous of somebody in a magazine. Yeah. Now, come on, um, let, we'll get back to this okay. and continue with you, Eva, as well. We'll be right back in a second. I mean, because we're talking like Bill, for instance, um, looks at porn movies and Suzanne feels jealous of the women in these movies and magazines. Is that getting in the way of the relationship? Can masturbation and looking at fantasizing about porn get in the way? It all depends. We're seeing some very specific cases here, but there are a lot of men who enjoy pornography, who enjoy masturbating. Let's face it, most and men women do. Too. And women do. Women too. Women do as well. But very often what happens when there's abuse or some other kind of inhibition of desire is that men turn to fantasy as a way of avoiding intimacy with their present mm -hmm. relationship. Okay, let me ask you this, because Bob has a, a problem here. He doesn't even fantasize. He's not interested. Yes. And he has admitted to a very important important revelations yes. here today. One, that he's willing to talk to a therapist, mm -hmm. which I'd like to, to have you continue mm -hmm. talking with him even after the show. And two, that he was sexually abused as mm -hmm. a child. Yeah. How do you think that is working on his relationship with his wife? Well, it's a very, very powerful component. Any sort of sexual abuse or what we would call emotional incest, uh, any early history, any sort of trauma at all can definitely affect uh, sexual desire toward a partner. And so what happens is, you know, we think of men is always having sexual desire and yet many many more men than we think experience loss of desire because of things that occurred early in their past. Now Doug you said you could relate to this is it a mm -hmm. sense of guilt that he has that every sexual situation is taboo well, is no, it we, maybe because they're homosexual tendency I don't know what it's is like, it? It's like if you if you got when you were a little kid and someone came up and hit you with a bat in the head every time you see someone with a bat you're gonna flinch. Mm-hmm. Okay what happened to you what happens to us when we're traumatized is it's trauma. It affects our whole being. And so going back into that same incident, it's like I know a guy who got in a tr tremendous car accident. Every time he goes down the street, he goes into a bubble. Okay, because that was traumatic. And every time he goes into the, going into a sexual 
thing. There's unresolved trauma. There's a lot of unresolved stuff that needs to work through. But so what? Is, what is Sally supposed to do about that? She loves this man, and she still has her desires. And well, she shouldn't take it personally. And that's, that's one right. of the worst things that women do. And I talk a lot about this in the book. It's not her fault. All of these men have sexual problems. They are their problems. So what can women do in each of these situations? What can they do to help their men? stay with them, to not get that anger, to not be little, but to stay strong in a relationship despite the difficulty. Well, the first thing a woman can do is understand that it is not her fault and she shouldn't take it personally. The second thing that she needs to do, regardless of the problem, these problems are serious and many others and most sexual problems can be solved, is to not ignore the problem. There's this classic thing that we all believe in that women should just say, it doesn't matter, honey. Well, the bottom line is it does matter. We see them when there is no sex in the relationship. It matters. It destroys the relationship. You need to talk openly. You need to uh, be supportive as well and say, I'll be with, with you as long as you're willing to work on your issues. I'll stay with you and okay. work on them with Some you. of the couples, and as well as some of the audience members, may have some questions. We've got to take a quick break, and we'll get right back to this. We'll be right back. have Sally and Bob I know that you were listening there um, Bob is there something that you would like to ask Eva or Doug I'd just like to you know really talk to a therapist since he said that he was abused as a child too I'd like to try to get something off of my off my chest find out why this is affecting me sexually by having sex with my, with my wife sometimes it scares me to have sex uh -huh. I really I just like to know why well, probably because, uh, Bob, I've been there, and I talk to men all over the country uh, on the phone with this issue because we're, this is private. This is tough. And you're the, one of the bravest men I know to do this on TV, and I want to thank you first. Um, mm -hmm. It affects you because probably what happened to you was not only sexual. It was probably there could have been where you felt there was a threat to your life, a threat to your being, a threat to your person. And there's... I mean, it's so complicated. Mm -hmm. but I wanna, one thing I want to say, there's a lot of hope. I'm, I'm having a healthy sexual relationship, healthy intimacy with my wife. We, you know, we're having our first child. You can, it can come back, mm -hmm. but there is a process from A to B, and uh, you can get there. Can I, can I just offer this? Um, Bob, I'd like you and Sally to work with Doug, if you could. I mean, our show will take care of that because I'm, I'm really inspired and, and I'm really encouraged by just listening to you that you want help. And we will, we will take care of okay. that. I really want to well, be able you. to hook you guys up so that you can share that. I'd like to do that if I could. If you, but Sally, Bob, are you, are you willing to do that? Yes, yes. I am. Okay. Thank you very Good. much. No problem. No problem. You know, let's, let's move on now. Fran and Alan, is there something that you would like to, to ask um, based upon what you are dealing with? Well, I know that, you know, it's more of, we need to do, we've talked with Eva and, um, you know, it's, it's amazing because it becomes role reversal and I think, you know, we need to probably, and she really, her question to me when we first talked was, didn't your doctor recommend some kind of sex therapy when you started having problems? Never entered his mind and mm -hmm. I, I can't understand why they don't, mm -hmm. you know, and, and why they don't work with therapists when this arises because this is becoming very common now yeah. we hear about it because we've had the celebrities who have, have prostate. you know have cancer but it isn't it isn't just cancer it's all erection problems and it's also men getting older and so mm -hmm. one of the things that i discovered with this couple was in fact that they were as subject to the mythology that men are supposed to get erections they're supposed to keep erections just at the slightest provocation i understand and based upon reading your material mm -hmm. that the older a man gets the more stimulation he needs Absolutely. and that women need to realize that that the foreplay yes. situation all of a sudden uh -huh. reverses uh -huh. it not only That's reverses come up with us mm -hmm. too. I, I'm 40 years old mm -hmm. now. I'm not like when I was 20. Yeah. You know, you look at a woman back then and say, Yeah, you, really, you gotta <laughs> work a little hard. I'm you know, and now. back then the wind blew and he was okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we'll be right back in a minute. We'll continue the conversation. <laughs> A lot 
lot of time, but in the short time that we have before we say goodbye, could you give us some of the blaring warning signs that let couples at home know if their problem is one where they need to start seeking outside help? If you have premature ejaculation, if a man is struggling with his erections, if he either has no desire or has suddenly lost desire, if you suspect he's suffering from a sexual addiction, definitely seek outside help. Mm -hmm. I want to add that all of this is very hopeful. Most men, do, many men have sexual problems, but most of those mm -hmm. problems can be solved. So seek out help earlier rather than later, because many of these situations never would have gotten quite as far as they have here had people gone for help earlier. Mm -hmm. Doug, anything quickly you'd like to add? I just want to reiterate that. Get help as soon as you can and, and, and get honest. These, these men are really brave to be honest. If a man will get honest about it, he doesn't have to experience 10 or 20 years and go into midlife crisis. He doesn't have to go into depression. He doesn't have to gain weight. He doesn't have to go to the gym. He doesn't have to buy a new car. And he doesn't have to miss out on sex. And he doesn't have to miss out and on sex. And he doesn't have to have an implant. That's right. That's right. You, you know something? I really want to give you three men a major mm -hmm. yeah. round of applause for your courage to do this. For your lady and your relationship, when you say, look, I'm willing to put my whole being on the line for this relationship, mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I really want to applaud you for that, we'll be right back after this. couples uh, for your courage to come on the show today. Sally, Bob, we certainly hope that the therapy session we're setting you up with is going to help save your marriage. I certainly hope you're going to take full advantage of that. We're going to check in with you and make sure everything's okay, all right? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Um, like we said, we decided to talk about this today because we are really committed to saving relationships, uh, saving marriages. And our experts were telling us here that the best thing that you can do if you yourself at home are having a problem, check your local area because there are support groups. You are not alone out here, even mm -hmm. though it's difficult to talk about. You are not alone. We want to thank all of you for being with us today. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Rolanda. <laughs>